Ah, the Ritz Carlton, a name known globally and associated with luxury and all fine things. From plies rapping about it to businessmen and all type of uh, resorts and Lord knows how many locations they got across how many countries and continents from Ritz Carlton, Singapore, Miami, Jakarta, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, resorts, luxury, people welcoming you in as you step aside, palm trees, crazy looking swimming pools, just amazing awesome needless to say i don't think you need me to tell you that this happens to be a on the pricier side of things and if i had told you my dear viewer that you know i got you a paid for stay at the ritz carlton for a period of um i don't know a few days a few months who knows who cares, but it's all on me. I think mostly I would be jumping from happiness. I mean, that's the Risk Carlton we talk about. See, the Risk Carlton in Riyadh is a whole different story. In fact, if we look at the video here, let's check the comments. Why is there an ad for a prison? <laughs> How well this hotel <laughs> works. <laughs> MBS Bramier. Alright. Now there was a story going on in the media worldwide about Saudi royals and businessmen getting locked up. Like Akon. Locked up, they won't let me out. But it wasn't some dirty prison cell. Nah. It was the Ritz Carlton, man. This piece of information left a lot of people wondering. A lot of them amazed, surprised. I, yeah, I grew up in Riyadh and I was surprised as well. But on the surface, you know, at face value, this sounded like a dream for most people, you know? I know a lot of people who go to jail today for nothing. But if you told them jail was the Ritz Carlton, like most people, you know, you like lock me up at the Ritz Carlton. But this is where I come in to let you know the truth. Because there's so much bias in the media companies, you know, and so much tiptoeing around the truth or twisting the truth to vilify or unvilify a person because of political interest. The truth tends to get lost in the middle. And even though I do have a bias that I will, I have to mention, I like MBS, but that don't mean I'm going to keep you spinning in circles, wondering what happened. Ladies and gentlemen, the Ritz Carlton imprisonment is way more scary and the truth is way much darker than you think. As a matter of fact, as we come to learn about this today, I'm pretty sure most of you who said, um, lock me up at the wrist, I'm pretty sure most of you will take that back. Let's just start first thing first. Where's God's in Riyadh was built by the Saudi royal family. And it was built to be the Ritz Carlton, but it was also built to have specific specifications for the royal family to use, such as, and this is unconfirmed, but you know, torture chambers, you understand, you know, hidden compartments, you know, stuff of that sort. Whenever a world leader such as Trump when he came to visit Saudi and Riyadh, 
he was received and welcomed at the Ritz Carlton. The same one. When the royal family needs that Ritz, they usually book the whole hotel for as long as they need it for. That means nobody stand at the hotel except them or whoever they want to stay, such as the detained people as we will come to see here. To understand how all of this came to be, we got to backtrack first. We got to rewind the tape so I can give you a background on who's who and what's what. Before we get into our uh, <laughs> complimentary paid for stay at the Ritz Carlton here today. All right. First, let me take you on a tour. Today's kingdom of Saudi Arabia, this established kingdom that we know, historically been ruled by older folks. MBS is a millennial. They used to say he used to be addicted to video games. He watches anime. Anime. Okay. Dude is really young. He came with power and overnight let the woman drive. You know, did a lot of things of that sort. Even though it threatened the power of this whole... <laughs> You know, Saudi Kingdom as we know it. But let's backtrack real quick. MBS is not king on paper. But currently he's running the whole show. In the year 2015, King Abdullah was the one in charge and he passed away. The selection process, the respected selection process... Uh, through the royal family and the way it's always been was you know fair and square was to select King Salman King Salman used to be Prince Salman used to be the Prince of Riyadh kind of like the mayor so King Salman takes power he is crowned King of Saudi Arabia the top head of state but this selection process with every king it selects a crown prince the selection process had been altered during the kinghood or the rule of king abdullah it had been modified slightly to include a new authority you see King Abdullah, his sons didn't seem to be very interested in becoming kings after him. They held high positions like head of the National Guard and so on and so forth. But they didn't want to be king. That's too much responsibility, too much eyes. Not everybody want to be king. So King Abdullah established the authority of pledging allegiance that's the best way to translate it in Arabic Hayat al -bay'ah. that authority was put in place so that they can be satisfied with the ruling process and since his sons have no interest in taking over as kings after he passes away he put that there so whoever comes next you know, it's kind of fair. And the top royals, majority have to, uh, in Arabic, you buy it, this new selected person. Kind of like a voting system. You buy it here means to pledge allegiance. In theory, this sounds great. So let's fast forward. Now, King Salman bin Abdulaziz had a brother called Naif bin Abdulaziz who passed away in Geneva. Naif's son, 
Muhammad bin Naif, a popular character in Saudi politics, known to be a businessman and a politician. He was known to be the Minister of Interior for like the last 20 years or so in Arabia. All right. He is the cousin of MBS, literally the son of his dad's bro, Uncle Naif's son. <laughs> He's been entangled in Saudi politics publicly and privately for many years. The Ministry of Interior was his toy of childhood, if you want to call it that. You know, some of you play with action figures. He was playing with the Ministry of Interior. Naif's sons and Naif, that was their section. All right. The Ministry of Interior um, was a big umbrella as well for things like um, the Drug Enforcement Agency, you know, the, the Arabian Feds. You get it. But Naif, for many years, his men under his, you know, little body of uh, government over there, they were the ones going after people who critiqued the government all these years. All these journalists and dissidents that were getting locked up, tortured, followed around, harassed, <laughs> disappeared, all right, only to get you know, skulls found under their buildings. You know, when Benayev uh, wants to renovate and move to a new location for one of his um, buildings, and the old building is left behind for a new person to come in, and then they start digging and they find skulls and bones under the that building, kind of like Jeffrey Dahmer or what's the other guy? Gacy or whatever, Casey. That's Benaya for you. Amongst dissidents, these people that went after critics and whatnot, they used to call them Benaya's dogs. The dogs of Benaya, or his goons, if you will. In the post 9 11 era, Saudi Arabia led a big old campaign against terror, you know, within and outside the kingdom. And Benayev played a big part of that. He was the head of uh, anti-terror, uh, at least in the kingdom that I know of. So he fought a lot of terror and he built up a very good relationship with officials in the U.S., as a matter of fact, we will see how the CIA and other officials try to come for his rescue later on. Back to the selection process. The royal selection process was as follows. King Abdullah was king. Prince Salman was his crown prince. When a king passes away, Crown Prince is the next in charge. He is to become king. When King Abdullah passed away, Prince Salman became King Salman. Fair and square. His selected Crown Prince by the regular normal way, that is fair and square, was MBN. He qualified, given that he was Minister of Interior for Lord knows how long. He kept this country together. He kept these dissidents from overthrowing, going crazy. You know, he fought terror. He got good relationship with the U.S. They love him. You know, that's MBN. So King Salman, King, MBN, Crown Prince. So far, so good, right? Cool. MBS at the time was just being MBS. He ain't had nothing to do with politics, not even from afar. 
this period that MBN was ruling and going crazy, MBS wasn't even picking up experience. He was just living the life of a young Saudi millennial, kind of like me. Except he had millions of dollars at his disposal. That boy did not give a single fuck about Ministry of Interior, Exterior, Roofing. He wasn't about that life. He was just living it up like a prince lives it up. Excuse my French, but he was just fucking bitches getting money. All right? Partying, you know? I don't even think he had any interest in politics. But one thing he said to have is a lot of love and a close relationship with his father, who is king. And fact of the matter is, his dad start to, started to show signs of um, dementia, you know, Alzheimer's, you know, that type of ailment, you know, as he is an older man. And his dad also did not like being in the face of people all that much because he was already Prince of Riyadh for Lord knows how long. And now he's the king of the whole country and got to deal with world leaders. He took an approach where he sits in the background and he let MBS and MBN at the time, you know, do their thing, talk to the leaders, set up business. His dad, Salman, King Salman, tasked him with being kind of like the CEO of the country, being the face of the king and his voice in meetings and conferences, stuff of that sort. And the Crown Prince MBN at the time was also given a little more tasks and a little more hands, you know, status upping responsibilities, if you will, all right? Basically, the king was trying to take the headache off his head, and he wanted to be like the queen of uh, England, where he is not so much into politics. He just sit back and take pictures and get to be this cool icon of the country. MBS was tasked with gathering money for the kingdom you see, for years, oil been the primary source for everything you see. But oil runs out after a while. And that fact been kind of looming over Arabia like a cloud for years. None of them wanted to face it. And he was tasked with changing things up so that the country doesn't rely only on oil. All right? As the weight and responsibilities of MBS started to grow and expand, so did his power and ability to change things in the country. And using the new powers he had at hand, he did things like cancel the religious police overnight, take away the authority of the uh, religious police, the scholars with the strict you know interpretations and whatnot a royal order to allow women to drive and facilitate the things that the giving them licenses and whatnot needless to say people loved mbs his popularity was through the roof this brought mbs a lot of lovers but it also scared a lot of people and raised concerns and criticism from within the royal family, especially at the top. People weren't happy with him removing these uh, uh, insurance policies of their ruling power. It threatened their power. It made MBS popular, but these boys felt like, hey, you about to collapse this whole thing. The love started to grow when he started to make this a more fair and just system. 
Because no matter what propaganda told you, it was not fair before. Back in the day, if a prince walked up and pow, popped you broad daylight, he would do no time in jail because he's a prince. But in Salman's era, they started to announce a royal prince high up there in the royal decrees gets an execution uh, sentence for committing murder. That was the first time where a prince gets treated like a regular person. Even MBS critics, you know, had to admit that this is, you got to respect it. He started to become loved by the people. They made songs about him. And it wasn't forced or anything. Like, people just loved dude. He gave them rights that they never had before. You can walk in a mall with a chick now. Girls used to suffer domestic violence with nowhere to go. Now they get to live on their own. Right? Without going to jail for it. It became a real country for the first time ever. You see what I'm saying? And the love doubled, quadrupled, it kept going. The scholars and religious folk were not happy about him canceling religious police. Men and women get to mingle. Hmm? That's blasphemy. And the royals weren't happy about their powers being threatened like they are. And they just executed a whole prince. Like, what do you mean? You know, their power is a, a threat now. So their voices and sabotage attempts started to grow a little bit. All right. The criticism of the scholars and royals reached the media where they described MBS as a unexperienced kid. You know, they mentioned the fact that he was addicted to video games. And what does he know about politics? And trying to poke holes in his ability and credibility in the eyes of the people. But the people weren't having it. MBS was the hero of the people. They loved MBS, and they did not want to hear what the preacher has been saying. They've been saying that for years. All right, the people had it with the unfairness. You know? So... MBS kept it quiet. But here's what he did. When he canceled the committee of uh, promoting virtue or whatever, aka religious bodies, he started a new authority or committee named the Authority of Entertainment. People happy. He started hosting concerts and Lil Wayne came to Saudi and all type of foreigners. It was beautiful for the first time. Scholars, mad. And then he did something crazy. He started an authority slash committee. The Committee of Anti-Corruption. Because of the whole movement that MBS was leading, he's making things more equal, more fair, and less corruption. It made sense. He was not a crown prince just yet, but he was the guy tasked with making this place better. He's just fighting corruption, as far as anybody concerned. Seeing that this authority was an enforcement agency, a law enforcement agency, they definitely have powers to freeze bank accounts and stop people from flying and arrest people under charges, you see. So comes November 4th of 2017, which is a few weeks after the creation of that anti-corruption committee. Saudi media announced the arrest of almost 400 people, but not just any random people. Government ministers, prominent Saudi princes, royals and business people 
This story was all over the news, all over the world. Not because of what he done, oh no, but the fact that they were held at the Ritz Carlton Hotel, not a prison. And the Ritz Carlton suddenly stopped accepting new bookings and told the guests to leave. Over there in the airport, private jets were grounded to prevent suspects from fleeing the country. According to Wikipedia, there are three theories behind the motives of this. The first one is a real, genuine crackdown on corruption. The second one is uh, this was a project to gain money, a little racket. Or the third, which is this was a method, a little play, conspiracy to take over the crown and power. My personal opinion, which one is it? It is definitely not a genuine corruption crackdown. <laughs> okay? And it is a project to get money and a way to take over. And let's see how this happened. MBS, they say he looks like his grandpa. Well, he acts like him too. MBS did the same thing his grandpa did. His grandpa took over the country with the sword. Anybody who wasn't with it <laughs> met the sword, let's just say that. Right? These people were put in there. And they were told like this, bro. Listen, you ain't coming out of here until I know for sure that you pose me no threat. He wasn't asking. He hit him upside the head if the answer was not yes, I pledge allegiance. As far as the public was concerned, though, the public already knew that corruption been going on. In the past, when a person reported corruption, snitched on him, all right, he usually disappeared. If he did not disappear, they would usually tell him, hey, look, you're going against some powerful people. If you don't shut up, we're going to shut you up forever. And when corruption scandals make it to the media, they'll look at you and tell you, so what? So what? We did not invent uh, corruption. So the people already knew corruption happened. What you going to do about it? They were sick of these people doing all that corruption and it being unfair. So when MBS put these people in the box, or the Ritz, and he said he was going to investigate and crack down on them, as far as the people were concerned, hey, listen, <laughs> MBS is a hero. He stood up to them people. He gave people the rights at the cost of royals being mad. The critic, the criticism on MBS never came from the people. They loved them. It came from royals who had their powers threatened and Muslim Islamic scholars who felt like things like women driving should be a crime. So the people loved dude. Obviously they had his side. They couldn't do nothing but respect it. Now, he is a hero. <sighs> but he wasn't really cracking down on corruption. He was cracking down on the ops. Okay. The arrest shook the foundations of Saudi society. In an instant turning untouchable establishment figures into targets for arrest. People who used to be untouchable. All of a sudden, they getting treated normal. And all these super strict scholars, women driving haram, all that, S, all that BS, he labeled them extremism and extremist ideologies. Extremism as in terrorism. So they, these corrupt people and extremist ideologies, pure scholars, spewing scholars, that boy came down on them with a sweep. 
a royal sweep. As many as 500 were rounded up in a sweep. Let's look at who got arrested. Prince Muhammad bin Naif. Crown Prince, but currently former Crown Prince. <laughs> A.K.A. MBN, his own cousin. Mateh bin Abdullah, head of the National Guard, son of King Abdullah. He wasn't too happy, but let's see how happy he going to be. He is seen as the most powerful of those arrested. Are we just getting started? Prince Walid bin Talal, billionaire businessman. Prince Khalid bin Talal, brother of Walid and businessman. Reem bin Abdullah bin Tal Walid bin Talal, Walid's daughter. Walid and his daughter and his uh, brother and all of them. Prince Fahad bin Abdullah, Deputy Defense Minister. Queen Fahada, the wife of King Salman, his own mother, he put her under house arrest. Prince Faisal, Saudi Red Crescent, Misad, Governor of Mecca, Turkey bin Nasser, President of Meteorology and Environment. The tree hugger too, he, he can get it. Anybody. Turkey, advisor at the royal court. Him too. It's like a grocery list of people. Prince Abdulaziz bin Fahad. He was said to have been killed while resisting arrest. Don't resist. But the Saudi Information Ministry <laughs> released a statement saying he was alive and well. He actually is alive and well. Muhammad the Tibeshi had a protocol that it uh, military officers, commander of the navy, Ali Gahtani, major in the army. Uh, you know, he's an army dude. He probably ain't take the torture too well, so he passed away in custody at the beautiful Ritz Carlton. Businessmen who are down with the program. Bakr bin Laden, chairman of the bin Laden group, and yes, the same bin Laden. He is half-brother of Osama bin Laden. I did a whole video on this company. The head of airlines, the dotted uh, Ethio Saudi billionaire, a tire travel group, Saleh, owner of the Arab Radio and Television Network, and whatever this is, chief executive of the telecom company. SDC, chairman of the Middle East Broadcasting Service, NBC, famous channel. A lot of people. And last but not least, Islamic scholars and media figures, mainly in the religious sector, you know? They used to be parallel with the rule, which used to be the power before Salman took them out um a lot of these people are big names and respected names in the in just the general but also in the islamic communities worldwide these are big sheikhs you know i was a Gurni, scholar author professor ali umari chairman mecca open university salman al oda scholar Member of the International Union of Muslim Scholars. You know, he's one of the guys that get to verify what Muhammad said and whatnot. Prophet Muhammad. I don't know, scholar, co founder, but da da. Researcher, lawyer, thinker. <laughs> they gave him something to think about. Ali Lamari, scholar, died in custody. This is how you get out the Ritz, if you are one of them 500. Now we're going to start from hard to easy. If you're one of the businessmen or the royals, this is what you got to do, bro. Your bank account is frozen, anything in the country at least. And you are banned from traveling. Okay, you can't leave the kingdom. If you just got money, we're going to get that money.
or at least a big portion of it, if not most of it, because money is power. So most of that money was seized, and a lot of them were forced to give it up. Second thing, you got to pledge allegiance to MBS and not oppose them. If you're not down with the program, you may not make it out the woods. Most of the people in the powerful positions got replaced immediately. On the inside, there was claims of torture and beating and all that, right? But on the outside, this is a corruption crackdown. Peacefully, right? You know, the sweet king is so sweet. He even put him in the Ritz Carlton. That's how nice he was. And the media, foreign media, such as Reuters and whatever, they came to see what's up. Especially with people like uh, Walid in there. Walid is famous for his uh, business ventures outside the kingdom. This is a guy who used to be cool with Trump and he'd be on Twitter or Facebook. So... They wanted to check up on him. Walid had to face the media real quick. He told them he was doing good. He showed them the suite that he was staying in at Ritz Carlton. Showed them he had food or whatever. He he even um, <laughs> he was working out. Basically, just to calm him down. His face, the way he looked, it looked like a bird in a cage. And it seemed that Walid was forced to give up a lot of that fortune he had. That's at least in the kingdom. I'm going to tell it to you like this. Truth be told, I'm not surprised. They took the country over with the sword. And the oil belongs to their family. So that's nothing new. They took this country over with the sword and the oil was always theirs. What MBS done is legendary in my opinion. I don't mind it. I think it's a great thing and it should have happened a long time ago. And Arabia right now, never been better. Is MBS a bad guy? My opinion, nah. I'm glad he did what he did. He made some mistakes. But this is as good as it gets. I never thought I'd see women driving with freedom like today. You might mention the Khashoggi situation. But I recommend you watch my video on Khashoggi. Because Khashoggi wasn't so innocent. And I have reason to believe that Khashoggi meeting the sword how he did. As gruesome as it is, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but <laughs> Khashoggi was playing both sides. He wasn't just the guy talking and he got got. It is what it is. You let me know what you think. If I made a mistake somewhere, please let me know in the comments. I'll correct myself. And um, check out my other videos on Saudi Arabia. The next one's coming, where I speak about the history of the pre Salman era. And when you get to hear these stories, you will understand why I like MBS. Even if he was evil, <laughs> again, this is as good as it gets. Hit like, smash, subscribe. It's your boy AK. See you in the next one.